All right. Good morning again, everyone. I'm Megan Matheson. I am the co-lead of the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum and also the Director of Strategy and Engagement for Clear Seas. And I'd like everyone to know that the session will be recorded and it will be posted on our website along with the presentation slides after this session. And then all of the registrants will be notified when the recording is available so you can go and catch up on anything you might have missed. Before we get started today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm joining from the traditional ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations and express my gratitude for their stewardship of these lands and waters since time immemorial. For a few brief introductions, um, the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum is a community of practice that's hosted by MEOPAR, the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network, and Clear Seas. The community of practice is open to all who are interested in the work of understanding and mitigating shipping risk. I'd like to thank you for joining this uh, fourth session in our webinar series, and we're today focused on technology um, that is water-based and its role in mitigating shipping risk. If you missed any of the previous sessions, I will put the links in the chat for you so you can go and check them out at your leisure. So a little bit about this series, um, we're investigating the different ways that technology is being applied to understand the marine environment with a particular focus on the activity and impacts of vessels that are not using automatic identification system or AIS transponders. As a result of this knowledge sharing, community of practice members can apply this range of technologies in new ways to address information needs for a safer marine environment. And following the webinar series, uh, we will provide a compilation of the technologies and applications shared in this series as a reference document for community of practice members to, to go back to. And so I'd like to um, let you know the agenda for today and encourage people to think of questions to ask. And you can either pop them into the Q&A um, or you can send them in the chat or you can uh, wait till after and uh, raise your hand so that I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Any of those avenues are welcome. And uh, today we're going to be having our first speaker is, um, you can see uh, Fritz Starr on the screen here with Open Ocean Robotics. Uh, he'll provide a presentation. We'll have some questions at 1035. We'll have a short break. Uh, and then at 1040, our second presentation from Scott Beatty with Marine Labs. Again, some question time. And then another short break at 1110. And then 1115, we'll have our third presenter, uh, Braden from Seymour Marine. And then we'll wrap up at 11.45 today. So I would like to start off by introducing our first speaker. Uh, we have Fritz Starr, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Open Ocean Robotics based in Victoria, BC. And he has been in this role for the past year. His work there includes guiding research, development, and manufacturing of uncrewed surface vehicles, or USVs, and associated data and control systems. Prior to that, he worked in the underwater vehicle and instrument space with profiling floats and ocean gliders, as well as doing research on hydrothermal vents and deep sea currents using autonomous underwater vehicles. His experience includes production and management, optomechanical design, and small nonprofit formation. He has a PhD in oceanography from the University of Washington and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford University. And I will hand over to Fritz to go through his uh, presentation with us. Oh, thank you, Megan, and uh, thanks to uh, Mupar and to Clear Seas for organizing the webinar series and putting this on and inviting us all to participate. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, what we do here at Open Ocean Robotics, which is uh, looking at the ocean from the surface um, using these uh, small robotic autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, that uh, we fabricate and operate from here in Victoria, British Columbia. Next slide, please. So Megan's going to be pushing the advance button here. So hopefully this works. So yeah, all right, it's working. <laughs> Great. Um, as I probably don't need to tell you all, uh, running crude ships is expensive. They're expensive to build. They're expensive to operate. Um, they can be difficult to schedule. There aren't that many of them. Uh, Collecting ocean data is something that we have traditionally done as an oceanographic community from cruise ships for a very long time, uh, but to do so is has you know become more and more difficult as we realize how much more of the ocean we need to ex explore. So next slide, please. Open Ocean Robotics was founded on the notion that um, it's possible to provide a lot of this data in real time without being uh, out there in person, uh, but rather remotely uh, by way of 
small um, surface vessels like the data explorer that you see here. In general, running such a device is uh, much more affordable. Uh, it's scalable in a way that's hard to with cruise ships because you can build many, many, many of these and put them all out at the same time and take data from a wide spatial area as well as over long temporal periods, um, which is very important to understanding oceanographic uh, processes and what's happening on the seas um, with shipping or other activities. Um, and these particular ones are all electric, so they produce no greenhouse gases. There's no risk of oil spills. There's very little noise that they make. They're extremely quiet, uh, which is very important when listening for uh, whales, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, in general, uh, this is the, the basic device that's on the water. It's called the Data Explorer. It's about a meter wide and uh, three and a half meters long. Um, it has a self-writing system on the back so that when it gets uh, flipped over by waves, it comes back upright passively. Um, there's no activity um, on it. And we can operate this uh, from pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, and as you see here on these uh, two lower views, we've got um, our Explorer view portal. Um, that is how we operate the vessel. So it connects to uh, land by way of either cellular radio or a radium satellite uh, or any kind of a mesh radio system that you want to set up as a, as a sort of private radio network like the uh, militaries often do. Um, and then uh, this can be used to do a variety of things, including uh, basic maritime domain awareness, what's out there, who's out there, what does it look like, um, who's broadcasting AAS, who's not, uh, and, as well as uh, listening for whales, listening uh, or measuring the water column for uh, oceanographic properties, um, mapping the seafloor using a multi-beam mapping device from the bottom of the vessel. Uh, so this is a, the range of things we offer, including uh, vessels for sale, as well as uh, what were, what's called contractor on contractor operated uh, activities, such as uh, surveying an area over a particular period of time uh, for a particular data set. Next, please. The vehicle itself is um, easy to store and ship and deploy because it's uh, you know about 130 kilograms. Uh, it has some customizable payload spaces. Uh, both inside the hull and outside uh, the little video playing in the lower right there shows our activities out in the surf break off of Tofino. Uh, and you can see that the vessel is quite robust uh, to this kind of wave action, which is something that one might expect um, at, in the high seas as well as near, near shore. It's quite shallow draft, so it's capable of uh, observing near shore in a way that is um, not true of a number of uh, other surface, uh, uncrewed surface vessels. So um, that nearshore capability and shallow draft actually allows us to go uh, make observations in places that a number of other uh, uncrewed surface vessels are, are not capable of going to. And as mentioned before, it's an electric motor, so it's extremely quiet. Um, and that makes a big, big difference when you're attempting to uh, listen to uh, marine mammals, et cetera. Next, please. So we have, uh, this is a, a, a bit dense of a slide, but it gives us gives you some details for those who are interested in numbers and uh, specifications. Um, we, we kind of have three different uh, lines of uh, work that we've done, um, including gray boats for uh, security and naval operations, um, particularly useful for border security and patrolling areas uh, such as we did with Task Force 59 over in the Arabian Gulf. Um, the, the, the basic size of the vehicle is such that you can actually put it into a shipping container fairly easily and get it places. Um, you can also hoist it up and put it on the back deck of a larger vessel uh, to, to move it around. Uh, but it is persistent. Um, you, it has 300 watts of solar panel on the top that are constantly charging the batteries. Our standard battery load is roughly 10 and a half kilowatt hours, um, but you can have up to 17 and a half uh, if you would like. Um, and that will drive the vessel for uh, quite some period of time. Our current longest mission is about 25 days uh, on the water uh, off of Hawaii. So 
We are working to add a profiling sensor package with a winch. Uh, as you can see, there's no winches in any of these pictures, but we're, we're working toward that capacity um, for the purposes of uh, measuring carbon, the carbon cycle in the ocean, uh, as, as requested by a lot of our, our new customers. Next slide. Um, as noted, uh, the environmental monitoring is typically uh, aimed at environmental agencies, uh, offshore and renewable energy companies are required to do this in, for instance, new wind farm areas. Um, the marine carbon dioxide removal uh, folks are very interested in understanding how effective their treatments are. And to do that, you need to actually measure properties of the water column. Um, fisheries agencies also are interested in tracking uh, where fish are and fish are, and then of course um, there are environmental regulations in ports that need to be uh, observed as well. Next, please. The bathymetric mapping is something that uh, USBs have been doing for a while. Um, you know, mowing the lawn back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to create a high resolution bathymetry product is something that is uh, important to a whole range of businesses. Uh, particularly shipping and transportation, but also uh, offshore oil and renewable companies. Um, and even for marine protected areas, understanding what the bottom features are in a MPA is, is actually important to monitor. It. So that's another activity that we can do from the Data Explorer. Next, please. And then as mentioned, the defense and security, this is an image of the boat that we outfitted with um, a special marine radio system uh, for use with Task Force 59, the U.S. Navy over in Bahrain, uh, and that's what's on the top of the pole there, and plus some infrared cameras um, in order to be able to observe what's going on in the dark um, around the Arabian Gulf. So this is also useful for fisheries agencies that are attempting to observe and protect against illegal fishing, which often happens uh, under the cover of night, and of course, uh, they're not broadcasting their AIS. So it's a matter of being able to go see what's there and see what they're doing. And that's where the Data Explorer um, does pretty well. Next, please. So the last part of this uh, slide deck is about a particular program that we did uh, in the uh, south, uh, southern um, Vancouver Island area uh, on behalf of the Department of Fish and Ocean here in Canada. Uh, looking at, in particular, the southern resident killer whales and the uh, in, interim transit zones. Next, please. I'm sorry, in, <laughs> interim sanctuary zones. Um, so the interim sanctuary zones were created specifically to uh, protect areas that the southern resident killer whales are known to inhabit for feeding uh, during parts of the year. So there's a couple of them that are... Uh, you know, looking uh, specifically at islands or around the uh, south end of the Strait of Georgia. Um, and we were asked to go observe one of those. Um, uh, next, please. Uh, in the period of October of uh, 2022. So uh, we were active um, down in the Southern Gulf Islands, right around Pender Island in particular. Um, in, in the interim sanctuary zone that is uh, there. Next, please. So the map on the left there shows the, the solid red area is the zone itself. The red line is the track of our USB, our data explorer. Um, we were out for 75 continuous hours um, covering about 94 nautical miles um, at an average speed of about three knots. And as you can see, we saw a number of uh, both mammals and vessels, uh, a number of uh, vessels, of course, broadcast in AIS, but some not. Um, and this was part of a, a operation to sort of prove the technology in terms of its ability to monitor uh, activity in and around um, the sanctuary zone. We were not allowed to go in the sanctuary zone as is, is aimed you know, specifically to be an exclusion zone for all vessels. Uh, so that was uh, part of the plan here and why the uh, red track line stays outside the uh, sanctuary zone. Next, please. Um, these are some of the spectrograms that we uh, picked up, um, including gray whales. Uh, don't know if you'll be able to hear the, the one 
uh, on the right there, but um, this is uh, some outlined areas on the spectrograms that we pulled in uh, during that particular mission from the hydrophone that we were uh, de that we had deployed off of that uh, data explorer. Next, please. I think one of the other um, key things is to look at uh, detection of non AIS vessels. So I know this is a this is often a, a big issue. Um, as part of our agreement with Transport Canada, we have a operator in the loop all the time. So the watch keepers were identifying vessels that were sighted by the cameras and then recording the acoustic signatures of, of those vessels as well. So that was that allowed us to uh, create basically a library um, for DFO of uh, vessel noise uh, created by the non-AIS targets, which of course included kayakers, um, all very quiet vessels, but of course a lot of recreational vessels such as the sailboat that you see here in the image uh, taken on the, on the fourth. Next, please. So that kind of wraps up the, the um, presentation. Uh, and this is my contact info and our website. Um, it can be reached uh, easily. And uh, this is one of our earlier prototypes with uh, our systems engineer um, working on uh, downloading data after after the uh, boat came back on back ashore. So um, and that's uh, something that we get to do is to bring in the high resolution data uh, as well as what's broadcast over over the air. So with that, um, I'm open to questions, uh, comments, thoughts, et cetera. Thanks so much, Fritz. That was really interesting and shows quite a range of, of applications, which is, which is really great. We have a couple of questions in our Q&A, which we can go to. And uh, I've got a few questions as well, depending on how many come from the audience. Yeah. So, um, we'll start with a question from Daniel Nelson, and he says, uh, Fritz, you mentioned the 25-day endurance in Hawaii. What kinds of distances can the USV cover? What is its preferred coverage area, and how does it compare to other USVs, such as the LRI wave glider? Yeah, so the um, as far as distance covered, it does depend a lot on the uh, speed and the uh, solar input, right? So the the season of the year, the latitude that you're operating at, um, all make a, a big difference. Um, so, for instance, in the Arabian Gulf, we actually covered, I believe, 250 kilometers over an 11-day period continuously, uh, operating at roughly uh, about a two and a half knot average average speed. So, it it really, like I say, it depends on how fast you want to go. They the energy balance between going fast and going far is uh, very much uh, tuned to going far at a slow speed. So um, you can go a whole lot further if you go slow uh, because you've got that much more energy. So, um, and I yeah, imagine it, your ability to collect data might be um, hindered if you're going too fast. Well, and, and it sort of depends on the type of data that you're attempting to collect, right? So if you're towing an acoustic array, you don't want to go fast, right? Because mm -hmm. those are those are definitely the that, that can make a lot of noise. Um, so yeah. um, and, continuing. Oh, sorry. Carry on. Yeah, I'm actually reading the thread here. So I see the yeah. question about the mission duration of greater than a month. Um, yeah, the duration uh, for a month. In fact, we're we've just. Uh, yeah, it, it really, like I say, it sort of depends on the two knot cruise speed to give you a sense of energy used. If we go the full sort of six knots maximum speed, that's using over a kilowatt of power all the time. At two knots, we're using less than 200 watts, so more about 150 watts. Uh, so, you know, for getting three times the speed, you're using, you know, 10 times the energy. Um, and that doesn't work out all that well. <laughs> so. It's, uh, it's it's far better to go slower um, and you can, yeah, and you can stay out longer. So that's that's our goal, it's uh, endurance. Uh, yeah, and so well, you mentioned well, you mentioned that the solar panels recharge the batteries continuously. Is, I assume at some point you have to bring it back in to shore to, to fully charge it up or? Yeah, typically, well, yes and no. Um, so for instance, the uh, 
mission that we just did, we ran all the way out to the mouth of the Straits of Juan de Fuca and back again over a course of 48 hours. So what was that? Um, I believe that was 185 kilometers. And uh, we came back with two thirds of our batteries still intact. Mm -hmm. uh, so relatively little uh, charging necessary in the uh, in the shop. And that was this week here in November in the Pacific Northwest. So um, I think we could have definitely uh, done that whole thing over again with the amount of battery we had left. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then in terms of the data, um, are you able to, you're, you've, you're showing pictures and things, so are you able to collect data continuously as the vessel is operating? Do you need to download some of the data directly from the vessel when it comes back in? Well, we have a uh, four terabyte drive on board, so we can collect quite a bit of um, raw data, uh, both visual and other from, you know, sen other sensors. Um, and uh, we do bring as much of that ashore as we can when we're in cell coverage. We have fairly high bandwidth uh, in terms of uh, getting data ashore. It's in the, you know, roughly five megabit per second range. When we're on Iridium Certus, uh, however, that's a much more limited bandwidth. So in that case, we're storing more on the vessel than we are bringing ashore. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And then you collect it when the vessel comes back into shore. Yes, we always download the full resolution data from all the hard drives when the vessel's back in the shop. So, yeah, absolutely. Or, yeah, ashore anywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. on the beach. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Jim Decker, who's asking, when you state clients are interested in carbon cycle data, what are you planning to collect data-wise as it relates to this? Can you give some examples of sensors that you offer or use? Yeah, so the uh, the primary sensors there are uh, conductivity, temperature, depth uh, package uh, that is added to with pH, uh, PCO2 sensors. Um, so those are the two extra primary extra ones, uh, but as well as that, uh, people are interested in having turbidity measurements. Um, if you know anything that can be put toward the purpose of measuring uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, so oxygen is another one that we measure. Um, th so these are the, the things that you would uh, measure with a standard CTD package. And then the other part of that is that we can attach these to the hull of the vessel, and so. You're taking data everywhere the vessel drives, but then we can also put them on a profiling winch package. So when you get to a particular spot, you can get a profile up and down in the water column. And we're targeting about a hundred meter depth for that winch package um, so that we can measure the upper hundred meters of the water column with, with these properties, um, as well as uh, putting another package on the bottom of the boat that would allow us to uh, continuously take data as the vessel drives around the surface. And uh, to continue the the winch uh, conversation, um, Robin Hulick has asked, what types of MBES sonars are you able to deploy on the unit? And do you have RTK corrections capabilities for data collection? With Finally, with the inclusion of a winch, have you been looking at side scan deployment? Um, yeah, so this particular, I'll address the side scan first. This particular vehicle is not very big and it's not very powerful. So most side scan uh, tow fish are fairly large um, and heavy. I think the smallest one that I've seen is still weighs in at 32 kilograms and is uh, a meter long by, you know, half a meter wide and third of a meter high. So um, towing a large, uh, heavily cabled object in the water is not our specialty. However, um, we do tow hydrophone, small hydrophone arrays. Uh, and as far as the um, multi-beam systems, we we have been uh, looking at a mounting, and we've actually run a Norbit uh, system, a wing head uh, multi-beam was the first uh, activity that we used the DA Data Explorer for to map the bottom of a lake uh, for DFO. Um, and we're looking into putting their newest model on uh, right now, the IWDS. So that plus um, the Ping DSP um, system uh, that's from here on Vancouver Island. So, so those, those two are the ones that we're um, looking at integrating. Uh, next. Yeah. Hopefully that helps, Robin. Yeah. Uh, the next question um, is a question about the length of the array, the frequency spectrum that can be monitored, estimated detection ranges for um, acoustics, visual, 
And uh, the last part of the question is, are there plans to put passive RF detection sensors on board in the future? Yeah, uh, let's see. As far as the frequencies and spectrums, that depends on the array. Um, we've been focused primarily on we're actually using right now a digital hydrophone from Ocean Sonics uh, that can detect up to 200 kilohertz. So uh, that's doing the southern resident killer whales as well as the humpbacks, the grays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's no reason that could not be put to use for the North Atlantic right whale population as well as the uh, belugas. I know the Transport Canada is interested in the beluga whale population that's in the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, as far as detection ranges go, it depends to some extent on the sound velocity profile in the area, what the roughness of the surface is, roughness of the bottom, and how deep the hydrophone is towed. So right now we have uh, some fixed length hydrophone cables um, that are 50 meters long, so we can stop the boat. And one of the advantages of our vessel is that it, we can't just completely go dead stop in the water and drift, uh, which is something that is hard to do with a wave glider. Um, and that allows us then to get the hydrophone down to a reasonable depth for a good detection range. But again, it does depend on what the acoustic propagation properties are within the water column um, at that particular moment and where what depth the source is at, as well as, you know, receiver depth. Uh, as far as RF, uh, passive RF detection on board, uh, we've looked into active uh, radars. Um, but uh, we have not uh, been asked as yet to put any particular passive RF uh, detectors on, on board. However, that is something that can be integrated. So uh, that's one of the, it, the beauties of having this platform is that it is possible to integrate a, a variety of, of sensors. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. I don't have any side scan or multi-beam data to show off uh, right handy, sorry. but. <laughs> Yeah, good question from from Anna, um, but maybe maybe some point in the future that'll be something we can we can share. Um, Anil Hain has asked, do you set a predefined track on the vessel before heading out to your area of interest, or is the vessel always controlled by somebody in the office? Uh, both. Uh, so we do define the mission beforehand. It can be uploaded to the vessel. You can the operator can uh, modify that mission on the fly. The mo operator can upload a new mission. The operator can say, hey instead of doing this mow the lawn thing, just go over here and loiter, which means to go to one spot, pick a radius, and then stay within that radius uh, over that spot. So that, you know, and that radius could be from a few tens of meters to kilometers, um, right? So that's the, uh, the mode that a lot of people are interested in for observations, uh, effectively hovering over a single point um, over the ground. But yes, predefined tracks are our standard practice. And when the thing is doing that, um, mostly what the operator is doing is just looking in the cameras and looking at the AES and making sure that we're following the rules of the road uh, and not, you know, being safe, right? Not running into anything, not letting anything run into us. Basic, basic marine rule of the road, don't hit anybody. <laughs> Yeah, definitely important. And just to follow up on that, so um, when you say you set it to loiter mode, is that where, you know, essentially a computer is controlling where it goes and an operator doesn't need to be involved or does an operator always have to be involved with the vessel, as you say, to make sure it doesn't hit anything or does it have any sort uh, of avoidance intelligence? It's, so it's, yeah, there's no actual onboard code yet to do particular collision avoidance and that's, um, partly because our agreement with Transport Canada is that there always is someone in the loop, right? Mm -hmm. So this is mm -hmm. this is a regulation. This is a Marine Transport uh, Review Board, uh, you know, letter, decision letter that we have that defines uh, the way we need to operate our autonomous surface ship. Um, mm -hmm. And those regulations are something that are uh, coming about slowly in every country. Um, here in Canada, they point primarily to the UK version of those policies. Uh, so if anyone's curious about uh, marine autonomous ship policy, uh, if you go to the UK's uh, website on that, you'll, you'll learn a lot. Um, as far as the loiter mode itself, that is autonomous. Once you tell it where you want it to stay and what its radius is, it's hands off and it does mm -hmm. it all itself. So 
yeah it's uh, but you still have a person there just in case you we have to have a person there mm -hmm. we are we are not permitted to not have a person in the loop that's just uh, that's part of the the rules of operating uh autonomous sh sh surface ships in canada so if you so if you have a vessel out overnight you've got somebody on on night watch correct but they can be doing it from their kitchen or their house or their favorite you know coffee shop right mm -hmm. so it, it you don't it, even though there is someone on watch they're in far more comfortable conditions typically than you are <laughs> out at, out at sea yeah so, oh, that's great so it's uncrewed but not really autonomous in terms of the the ship is not operating itself that's um, right. No, um, our, our, our MTRB letter states that the operator is the master, right? Yeah. And has all the responsibilities of a master, except for the fact that there's no people on board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the main responsibility is those, you know, don't hit other boats, right? That's, <laughs> like, it's very important. Well, that's, that's really that's really interesting. And there is certainly a lot going on in the world in other places in terms of what what vessels can do in terms of uncrewed or autonomous operations. And you know, Norway has got some some ferries and self-docking vessels and um, even a cargo ship that can operate autonomously. So it'd be interesting to see where, where Canada goes in the next few years. Um, going back to our, our Q&A, um, Blanca Montoya asks, the toad hydrophone arrays, are these for all frequencies monitoring, such as low, medium, and uh, low, high, and medium? Yeah, so we've towed, uh... Arrays made by Geospectrum, uh, M512, M508 uh, with JASCO, uh, Ocean Observer. We have towed those also with SMRU's Decimus recorder and the Ocean Sonics. And all of those, I believe, are capable in of reception up into the 200 kilohertz range uh, from, from the very low end all the way up. So, yes, um, I don't know what your definition of high frequency is, but 200 kilohertz is pretty high. <laughs> By, by by my estimation um yeah and uh yes you can actually just stop the boat and let the hydrophone dangle below and listen right so the array whatever whatever you're hanging from that cable off the back of the boat uh will just sit there uh, underneath the boat uh listening um and even when the boat is on and moving it's you know the electric motor is very quiet but mm -hmm. being able to go completely dead in the water um and make zero noise whatsoever is even better. So that's uh, one of the advantages. Uh, the next question is from Robin Hulick asking about performance in cold Arctic environments. Uh, how does the battery perform? Uh, can it navigate around ice? And uh, also, Robin also mentions that uh, the video of the unit surfing yeah. was pretty cool, which I agree, it was very cool. Yeah, we... I'm glad I was not on that. Right, we do like our surfing video. We have not operated in the Arctic yet. We would like to. Um, I have been in talks with the folks at the ice tank uh, that's run by the National Research Council in St. John's, Newfoundland, um, in order to get a vessel into that tank. It's a fairly big tank. I think it's 90 meters long and 10 meters wide. Um, and so our plan is to go take one of our data explorers to the tank and run it there. And uh, I believe they can crank the air temperature down to minus 10 and then form uh, ice on the surface of the water at various thicknesses. Um, so that's our, our our plan is to go get some certification done there before we make we make the claim that we can operate in the Arctic. But um, I, right now, I can't say that we've gotten really any further north operationally than uh, we've got, I don't know if we're further north in Halifax, but we've got a boat in Halifax right now. So, um, and then it of gets, course here- It gets cold Vancouver, there. Yeah, it gets pretty cold there. So, um, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, have you found any differences in how it operates in you know you've got it in Hawaii versus Halifax? Is there in terms of battery life or other performance? Nothing terribly noticeable. Um, lithium ion batteries uh, do reasonably well in what I would call you know average temperatures, and the ocean in these parts keeps keeps the temperature inside the boat pretty, pretty average uh, when it turns, when it comes to uh, um, warmth. Uh, and of course, we're generating a certain amount of heat within the vessel itself with all, with the two processors that we run, et cetera, and the cameras. So um, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of extra heat that we generate ourselves. Uh, so. 
Right. In the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, we need to wrap up shortly so we can get on to our next presentation, but I want to um, wrap up with this, this question from Gray Knights. Uh, does open ocean robotics make data that they collect available in part or in full to all mariners, or does the data always belong to the company that purchases your services? One recommendation from research on shipping risk mitigation is alliances and collaborations between shipping companies and other entities like harbors, et cetera, and I'll throw communities in there, coastal communities and indigenous communities. Is there a responsibility to share a certain level of data for safety if that data is available? Um, I, so as far as the latter goes, uh... I don't know that, uh, you know, as a private company, we have a particular responsibility toward um, sharing data for safety purposes, because that data is also being collected by the, you know, the bodies that are in charge of enforcement. So DFO, RCMP, et cetera, actually are collecting um, their, their own data. Now, along the line of uh, the data sharing, so we, are, we do plan to offer data products in the future. We don't just yet. Uh, but the initial data collection is uh, usually controlled by whatever uh, end user license agreement or other contractual agreement we have with the department or the company or the agency that purchases our services. So, for instance, when we worked for the United States Navy, uh, our data was theirs until they had released all of their publications and uh, broadcast information about their activities. Then we were allowed to share certain bits of that to show off our, our uh, capabilities. Um, as, uh, as far as working with agencies for marine shipping, uh, we're in discussions right now with the BC Pilots and the Pacific Pilotage Authority, uh, as well as the BC Ferries about doing observations uh, in, in this uh, particular uh, Vancouver Island area uh, for the purposes of um, mitigation uh, of risks for whales. Uh, so, in fact, you know, some of the folks who are coming to us are those those very uh, agencies that are dealing with these uh, regulations and safety concerns on a regular basis. Um, but, uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, sharing that data, um, if there's, yeah, if there's an area of operation that you would like to uh, see some data from, uh, get in touch. We'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, because, in fact, the data that we collect is ours unless it's specifically otherwise uh, covered in a contractual agreement um, with the with the customer. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That was a really interesting presentation and so many possibilities with this technology. So I'm excited to see more going forward. And hopefully there are opportunities to, to share some of the data because that's um, just so much more efficient than the, the current way of sending out a, a full crude vessel. Right. Um, we're going to switch over now to our get ready for our next presentation. Um, uh, everyone take a short break. Maybe let's let's do three minutes and then come back and we'll try to get back on schedule. And uh, Fritz, if you have the, the time, maybe you could answer some of the remaining questions that are in the Q&A. You can just click on type answer and, and type an answer in. And then the if you're if you've got the time for that, that would be sure. great. Oh, yeah, happy to do that. Do that. Thanks so Thanks. much. All right, everyone take a short break. We'll be back in at uh, 1043 to do our next presentation. All right, let's get started again. I'd like to welcome Scott Beatty. And Scott is the CEO and founder of Marine Labs and a deep tech entrepreneur with over 18 years of experience in marine technology and R&D sectors. And uh, for a little bit about Marine Labs, it's a BC-based coastal intelligence company that is providing high-resolution data services in North America wide to maritime and coastal industries. Under Scott's leadership, Marine Labs has grown from a small startup to an industry leader. In 2021, the company's proprietary technology captured the most extreme rogue wave ever recorded, a finding so significant that it was profiled everywhere from CNN to National Geographic. Based in Victoria, BC, Dr. Beattie is internationally recognized for his marine technology expertise. His academic uh, publications are widely cited, and he served as a technical judge for US DOE, UK, and Canadian funding agencies, allocating over 100 million. He has a PhD in ocean wave energy, ocean engineering from the University of Victoria. And over to you, Scott. Tell us all about Marine Labs. Thank you, Megan. I sent you a very long bio. Um... But uh, much appreciate the opportunity here to to chat with the the Clear Seas community and uh, 
Yeah. So I, I come from a mechanical engineering and ocean engineering background, and I wanted to kick it off with a few slides that um, are a bit topical right now and, and kind of give you an idea of what drew me into this field um, from an interest perspective. And then I'll talk about what Marine Labs does after. So let's see if I can control this thing. Um, so the Normandy landings uh, from World War II, uh, um, if you're a history buff, you might or you probably know more about this than I do, but um, there was a, a need to preserve the element of surprise for the landing. And in order to do that, there was a need for weather forecasting, um, specifically wave forecasting, because the amphibious vehicles could not handle waves above four to five feet. Um, but to preserve the element of surprise, they needed to go at uh, still in a stormy environment. Um, and so that's what a fellow named Walter Monk did. He created the first wave forecasting theory uh, while working for the US Navy. Um, and that theory became so important and so pivotal uh, in order to preserve that Normandy landing. And so for me, um, in Remembrance Day, that's one of the, you know, in the lead up to Remembrance Day is one of the things that I think about. So Walter came to University of Victoria and gave a lecture before he passed away. And I happened to be in the room when I was doing my master's degree. And he talked about his story about measuring waves and coming up with uh, the theory of, of wave forecasting and the story of, uh, of that Normandy landing prediction that he'd made. Um, so very, very interesting. He's become the father of wave forecasting in the world. And his, his theory, it was the original kernel, but now it's being discretized over the Earth's surface so that we can use computer models to run those types of calculations all over the globe. And so with satellite measured wind data and uh, with these computer models, but with the original Walter Monk theory at the core of it, we're able to predict where this waves will be uh, in say a week's time. Uh, what size will they be? What, were the, what will their uh, period be? What will be their character? It's very, very interesting to me um, as a person who grew up in British Columbia and living on Vancouver Island and um, surfing as much as I can. This has changed my life. And so uh, Walter Monk has become an honorary uh, uh, surf, I think it's surf rider honorary member uh, because of his, how he changed the world in terms of predicting surf. So you see people traveling thousands of kilometers on planes in order to go and meet a swell. This is a place called Chopu in Tahiti, and this uh, is where the Olympics will be, uh, the next surfing in the Olympics. But I mean, this wave looks incredible. The, the science, the theory, everything around it, I just love. I find it so, so interesting. And this is what kind of continues to draw me into this. Um, so people... Uh, trying to catch massive waves, the footage that everything about it, prediction, uh, I just find it super exciting. And the character of the waves themselves as well. I mean, sometimes the sea looks extremely rough and scattered and diffuse, and sometimes it looks perfectly organized like you would see here. Um, sometimes the, the surface, uh, surface waves come from different directions and make this completely beautiful crossing pattern that you would never expect to look so regular and so organized. Anyways, this is something I wanted to kick it off with just to drop people into the reason why I'm doing this. So a bit of overview about Marine Labs. We're a Victoria-based company. Uh, we have 16 employees right now. Um, we are op operating in both the Pacific and the Atlantic, and we have various partnerships and affiliations uh, in the delivery of our services and the development of our services, validation and, what, and whatnot. But I will uh, continue on. So some of you may remember this. This is the, the Zim Kingston, and it had a, uh, a fire in some of its containers that got so bad that it had to get uh, it had to come into port in Victoria and get sprayed down for days. Um, it had lost something like 90 containers. And this is in October, 2021. And so I think overall, this represents a problem that is that shipping, uh, that shipping is faced with risks. That's why we're all here. But with increasing weather volatility, with increasing uh, uh, climate change driven weather, 
as well as larger ships, but ports and channels being roughly the same size, we have a challenge where, uh, where we're going to need to face this challenge with something. And so we think that data can help solve that problem. Uh, for reference, the significant wave heights where the ship was loitering off the Strait of Juan de Fuca uh, were 12 meters. And so there probably could have been a different decision had that weather data been known. Um, perhaps they would have been um, in a different area. I'm not exactly sure who made that call and how that happened, but this was definitely a significant event in the history of Victoria Harbor and Vancouver Island region. So to address that, we think that everything that floats should be a real-time data station. Um, that, I mean, I, and I think Fritz would agree with that too. Uh, you know, whether it's moving around and floating on a, whether it's on a mooring line or not, there's a lot of opportunity to gather data. And so if we look at the kind of existing ways of gathering data, the ocean observing platforms, the classic ones would be known as ODAS or ocean data acquisition systems that you see on the left. They're very expensive. They need large ships with cranes to deploy, to maintain. If there's outages, it takes a long time to get those ships uh, into place to then go and maintain these units so they can be down for large periods of time. And so it makes the data collection very expensive. Um, on the right is what's possible. There is a navigational aid system like the buoy you see behind me. There are 10, there's roughly eight to 10,000 of those in Canada, and there's almost 40,000 of those in the US, which could all be real time data stations. So, why are we interested in that? Well, maritime safety, we think that we can help ships avoid uh, weather mistakes within weather, make better weather calls, which will minimize the chance for accidents, incidents, spills, loss of life. Um, but we also think that collecting this data along coastlines along, you know, from tens of thousands of locations will allow us to better forecast what climate uh, is going to do along coastlines. There's an entire field of engineering called coastal engineering, where people are actively trying to calculate how large breakwaters should be levees, seawalls, in order to protect against coastal flooding, which will be a major impact moving forward. So at Marine Labs, we build rugged self-contained sensor units that look like this. Um, this is a solar powered uh, unit that has telemetry. It has cell and satellite telemetry. It has a directional wind sensor, and then there's a camera module and we have other modules as well. The system is meant to be bolted on to existing flotation. So that can be smaller floats. It can also be larger buoys that already exist. So this is a small package. Uh, we build, uh, we have these manufactured in Canada, and then we assemble them and commission them in our office at, uh, at Marine Labs in Victoria. They provide directional wave information, directional wind, camera, um, and these things are extremely rugged. We are literally smashing them with sledgehammers and shaking them with construction shakers, um, submerging them, um, freezing them in order to make sure that they meet the specifications to be able to survive at sea for multiple years without us interacting with them. So we deploy them on small buoys. This is about a meter diameter buoy. This particular one is in Prince Rupert Harbor. Um, there are some currents limitations. Uh, if there's high currents, it's harder to measure in with smaller buoys, but uh, in most areas we can deploy these. We also deploy them onto navigational aids. Um, so this is a, a navigational aid in um, Nova Scotia, where you can see our unit is mounted to the top of the nav aid above the lantern. Here's another one in Prince Rupert where you can see our units mounted to the top uh, of the of the unit. So we actively work with the Canadian Coast Guard and the US Coast Guard to deploy these onto the navigational aids. The benefit of our system is that it's four bolts and all of a sudden we have a real-time data station. Uh, whereas if you wanted to put a new ODAS buoy, you would need a large ship. There's only one buoy tender that can do it in the Pacific, uh, in ca Canadian Pacific. Um, and so that would take uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of time in order to, to deploy, whereas uh, with our technology, we simply bolt it on. 
And so the ruggedness tends to pay off. We've had, uh, obviously, in the development of these, we've had a lot of failures, but we've refined the product now to the point where this thing can be completely overtopped by giant waves and it is still operating. Um, so we've measured multiple hurricanes. Uh, we measured Hurricane Lee uh, in September in uh, off of Halifax, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, this is a buoy uh, off of the entrance of uh, Euclulet, uh, known as the red can buoy to the local fishermen. And uh, you could see there's a, uh, a, a massive breaking wave right next to it. The buoy itself is 16 feet high. So that wave is uh, a lot higher than that. So all the data comes into our cloud platform where we process it and then we display it and provide access to our customers um, so they can access it via browser or by, or, or by phone. Um, so I'll, that is our sort of standard way of interacting with the product. It's, it's effectively a software as a service product for the, from the customer's point of view. Our, uh, our fleet is Canada wide. So we have units up in Prince Rupert, um, a buildup there. And in the Douglas Channel, we have a, a large buildup in Southern Vancouver Island, Gulf Islands, Vancouver region. I can talk about that more in a bit. And then we have units deployed in Placentia Bay and Newfoundland around Port of Basque, and then down Nova Scotia, outside Halifax, Southern Nova Scotia, and into St. John, New Brunswick. So our, our model is a subscription-based service, like I mentioned. We own and operate all the hardware, and we ensure that it has the highest reliability and the highest uptime percentage for the, for the customers. And then we provide subscriptions to the data for ports, vessel pilots, um, tugboat operators, and other industry. And then uh, they can access it through our Coast Aware platform. So why do coastal communities care about this? The first thing I would say is in a port region, we've got many, many vessels coming in and out. This type of data provides better awareness to the harbor masters, to the pilots, to the ship masters, to the launch pilots. This can all make that whole operation more efficient and safer. Um, we think that there could be a, a significant number of uh, incidents and accidents avoided with this type of additional data. Another reason is that we're providing an environmental monitoring uh, service. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there is this climate resilience piece as well, which I think is going to be more and more important moving forward. So on the safety and efficiency side, ports can handle larger ships in tighter weather margins. Um, there can be weather delays that are reduced so that save, literally saves them money. If a vessel uh, comes in late by an hour, that can be $50,000 of lost revenue. That can be an entire crew with cranes like the ones behind me sitting there waiting for that ship when it, they didn't need to be waiting. That's a very costly loss. That's something that we can reduce. Um, and then again, the incident and accident avoidance. Sometimes ships have issues when winds pick up very quickly in that weren't forecasted. And the, a ship is when it's moving slowly is like a big giant sailboat and the winds can be the dominant factor, which can cause the ship to be hard to handle. Um, and so some of that can be avoided when we have much better data. Our service is tailored to the port. So we're filling gaps in the weather data that they, they have. So there's, you know, national weather services, there are forecasting services, but there are large gaps in those services. Our data is more frequent, it's more accurate, and we provide it as a much more reliable service. Another kind of benefit of putting many units, many smaller units rather than one large is that if one goes down, you still have the other units in the region providing real-time data. Whereas if the one ODAS buoy off of a port goes down, it's down and the entire industry is left with nothing. Uh, perhaps they're trying to look at some publicly available website like Windy or locally it's often bigwavedave.ca which is meant for kiteboarding. It's not meant for navigating ships. So we provide this reliable, redundant service. Um, another thing uh, that kind of is an addendum that we provide to, for that weather awareness is buoy cam data. So our buoy cam module provides 360 degree views of the, of the uh, ocean around the buoy and that 
can be useful for a bit of context about what's going on at the buoy. What's the visibility like? Can I or can I not see a landmark that is, say, two nautical miles from that buoy? Uh, it you know it's it is a, a an interesting use case when the data itself may speak to you, but having a picture and the data makes a big difference. Um, these cameras aren't extremely high resolution. There's a lot to be gained on in that direction for us. But for us, because the way we design our units, they have to be extremely low power. Um, we're looking for these to be out there for years at a time without interaction. So to meet that power requirement in our small package, we have to make sure that we um, control the cameras perfectly and make sure there is no wasted energy. Here's a picture in Hurricane Lee off of uh, Halifax. This is Halifax Bravo buoy. We in this same time period, we measured um, 18 meter maximum wave height. And I believe this is the tail end of that wave train. We also see birds land on them. That's kind of fun. I'm not sure if uh, if the ocean explorer, the data explorer has had birds land on the camera, but it's always fun to see some wildlife. Okay, and I'll talk about this other piece. So we, we signed a partnership with Kongsberg. They are a Norwegian multinational company that provides sonars and many other products within the maritime space. Um, so we, this new product is called Birthwatch, where we will be providing the software side of a depth monitoring uh, solution in birth pockets, in ports. So the, the, uh, the sonar is mounted to the side of the berth, and then a scan can be uh, taken of that berth pocket, and then the data comes through our platform and viewed by the load master and the harbor master to ensure that the depth is uh, sufficient for a vessel to come in and also sufficient to continue loading a vessel. So what this does is it helps open up ports after disaster events or after siltation events down rivers, but also it helps um, optimized vessel loading in areas where there's a concern about uh, vessels uh, basically running aground just because they're loaded with too much cargo. And what that ends up doing is giving assurance to load more cargo, which means there's more revenue potential, but also a uh, bit more efficiency in the, in the um, uh, delivery of that cargo. Um, so a couple of Happy customers, we've got a uh, Harbor Master from Port of Prince Rupert who uses this data on a regular basis to decide whether they're shutting down the terminals to decide which anchorages the vessels should go to. Um, he has multiple units, one from the pilot boarding station outside the port all the way into the inner harbor where they can measure winds there uh, to determine uh, sort of near the terminal op opportunities and optimizations. Same with Port of Halifax. We have five units outside of Port of Halifax. They are an interesting scenario in Canada where um, if the waves are too large and the vessel is of a certain size, they're actually concerned the vessel might strike ground on its way in to the harbor. And so they have to um, uh, solve this with uh, lookup tables, understanding when is that risk high. And so the data, the, the, the wave data itself is absolutely paramount for them. From an environmental monitoring point of view, we've been doing a bit of work, taking our data and converting it into uh, insights that matter for understanding the shipping effect on coastlines. And we've been working a lot with indigenous groups to work on that on, on, on that aspect. So this is uh, Chief Gordon Planis and I, after deploying one of our buoys in the, in, uh, the Sauk territory. Um, this is uh, just the entrance to Souk Harbor. Um, with this buoy, we measured 30,000 vessel wakes, about 10,000 vessel wakes per year. So we were able to provide a, a count of the vessels coming in and out of the harbor, whether they have AIS or no AIS. And we can slice that count by uh, vessel type. If there's AIS, we can categorize that because we have an algorithm that attaches AIS data to our vessel wake event measurement data. And we can also provide time of year, hour, et cetera, type of reports. So this is something that we're actively doing in multiple regions. We've done this in Burrard Inlet with Tsleil-Waututh Nation. We're doing this in Howe Sound, and we're also doing this in Kitimat region. So on the climate resilience part, uh, so coastal engineers typically try to forecast what the extreme 
uh, flooding events will look like, and then they'll propose structures that protect against that. And often that's done with desktop studies, um, looking at trying to propagate what we're in, let's say in a king tide event with very high wind and waves, uh, what will happen uh, as waves propagate into a harbor and uh, what's the maximum wave size we should see in a hundred years. And so then how should I build my breakwater or my pontoon or whatever my infrastructure will be? Um, well, with our data, we can just measure that propagation rather than using a deck desktop study. And we also help validate the uh, desktop studies because sometimes there's a lot of uncertainty in those. And that uncertainty is uh, basically translates into conservatism, which makes projects expensive. So we have an opportunity here to directly measure what is normally modeled. Um, so in this is uh, in Esquimalt Harbor, uh, where the Navy base is in Victoria. And you can see wave measurements compared from the outside to the inside. And you can see that the inner wave heights are a lot smaller. Now ex we can actually take the ratio and we have exactly how much smaller they are rather than trying to make a guess using some desktop study. So in summary, we provide real-time historical and insight data products as a service. And we're making coastlines safer, greener, and more climate resilient with that data. And uh, so it's been a pleasure. Happy to take any questions if I have any time left. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, yeah, that covered quite a lot of water. I was going to say ground, but covered quite a lot of water in your uh, your presentation. We do have some questions coming up, and um, I've got a uh, oh, it's a actually it's an answer coming up. Uh, Kate, uh, Callan's starting off with uh, data explorers had a bird land on it and it was captured in the cameras. Cool. I'd but, love to um, see that picture. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty fun to see a little bit of wildlife. Um, to start off, a question about how far back can you get data for? So I guess when did you start tracking um, with your with your sensors? Because they're some of them have been out there for a little while now. Yeah, so we've had units out since 2020, and our fleets expanded since then significantly. So our longest data records are uh, roughly three years, um, and then our shortest ones are sort of starting a week ago. Um, the team is constantly deploying new units, but if you have a region that you're interested in, get in touch with us and we can take a look at what our backlog is and then um, see if you can, if that data is relevant for, for your needs, if your projects. Okay, thank you. Um, a question that I had, uh, you know, at, towards the end of your presentation, you brought up tracking uh, non-AIS vessels, and that's something that is a particular interest for this series. And then also just thinking about, we saw a few weeks ago, we had a presentation from uh, Transport Canada showing how they were using the um, national aerial surveillance planes to track uh, non-AIS traffic. And it's tricky because you have to have somebody spotting right now. We have to have somebody spotting the vessels from, from the air. Um, but they assume or estimated basically about three times the number of vessels out there uh, are non AIS as compared to AIS. And they tend to have much more erratic patterns. Um, what sort of a coverage network would be necessary to be able to use these sensors to have a, a reasonable understanding of the uh, activities of non-AS vessels up and down, let's say the, the Pacific coast between Prince Rupert and Vancouver? It's a big question. I mean, um, using vessel wake as a signal is challenging in exposed locations when you have a lot of wave mm -hmm. energy from, you know, from swell or from storms. It's a signal to noise challenge. Um, the but in constrained harbors and waterways, or maybe, you know, Gulf Island regions or areas where there's concern about um, vessel interaction with wildlife, um, I, it's a tough, tough to give you a number. I think mm -hmm. it's a, it's sort of, it's case by case. Um, it depends on the, you know, the study of interest. I, I think if we were to, I, I, can't, I can't claim that we would track every non-AIS vessel along the coast. That is a very, uh, that's like saying, how many CCTV cameras do you need to monitor, uh, you know, the entire city? It's just a very difficult question, mm -hmm. but uh, that's kind of, it's mainly about, do we have a region or a constriction or an area of interest we can start measuring in that location? 
on a on a case by case basis. And I think it also points to the um, applicability and the the usefulness of of different types of technology. Like it's fantastic for tracking wave action and um, lots of get it, gathering lots of information. And as you were talking, I was thinking of a number of different um, challenges that I uh, have heard of in the past where um, a lot of complicated um, machinations and calculations are needed to figure out is it actually safe for ships to come in because of the wave activity and ships are getting longer and so when they when they um, move in the swell they're going to be uh, they need more draft to avoid contact with the bottom and so having more um, accurate data when it comes to wave action allows for that um, more optimized uh, activity as you as you pointed out so I think that's a really fascinating uh, in, application uh, in, in port of Halifax it it's quite critical and um, they've just installed new cranes, which allow them to bring even larger ships in. Mm -hmm. So it becomes more critical um, and it becomes critical to have a reliable data source or a reliable measurement of that input in order to make the decision. But when you're stuck with one unit that it has outages that are months at a time, that's where our solution comes in. Mm -hmm. Thinking about the birth watch, the new, um, partnership with Kongsberg, Kongsberg um, air draft and water draft is a challenge at the port of Vancouver, for example, with the, the Lionsgate Bridge, the second narrows, um, ships need to be able to safely pass under them. And as the ships get larger and larger, those um, margins for error uh, become even more critical. Is that, uh, is that an area where you'd position the birth watch type sensor? We typically put it next to the place where the um, ship docks so right at the right near the cranes at the dock and and that's sort of the application there and it's really about um, is there anything new underneath the ship that has shown up since the last time we did our surveys um, often ports will survey their birth pockets but they'll do that periodically. Now, if there was a big frechette event or a bunch of silt that came down the river, this might be more interesting at Fraser Surrey docks, for example, where they do mm -hmm. have that issue. Mm -hmm. um, you can take a scan multiple times per day to get assessment of how that change is happening and then how to better operate that terminal. Um, so around bridges, it's I think it's been done. I think Kongsberg's done that on one-off products, uh, one-off projects, air gap, not really doesn't really do that mm -hmm. but um specifically underneath the ship at the birth pocket yeah and dredging is also a, a concern for ports so to be able to maintain to do the amount of dredging necessary but probably not much more than that to maintain their their channels uh so i think yeah, it sounds like that would be really helpful. Uh, we have another question. Uh, is there a potential of measuring storm surge at a sensor boy location? Yes, absolutely. Um, we currently measure uh, we measure waves, um, and waves, as you know, are a fairly high frequency phenomenon compared to storm surge. And so, to measure storm surge, we need effectively a water level measurement, um, and that is something that we are actively building and fairly close to commercializing. So. You can expect storm surge, tidal level, and tsunami measurements at each of our locations once we've commercialized that part of our roadmap. I guess continuing on the storm surge idea, do you see many municipalities with an interest in in collecting more data, thinking about how their their needs for shoreline protection are going to change over the coming years? Yeah, I mean, if we go super local uh there is the you know vancouver seawall had its erosion um impact we had kits pool flooded and had to be rebuilt uh, but we also have delta and surrey with very low lying areas and there's a lot of active measurement and try attempt to mitigate the the future flooding that can come from storm surge and king tide and, and increasing weather volatility there's other places in British Columbia, Comox is an example, there's some other ones, uh, but we are seeing a lot more of this and a lot further ahead than we are in places like uh, Miami, Louisiana, obviously these uh, heavily affected areas uh, mm -hmm. for storm surge. But, uh, but yeah, there is, municipalities are gaining uh, a lot of interest and climate resilience, as we've seen, uh, has become a word that is now normal, whereas maybe four years ago, it wasn't. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I think that the, the mentality is changing, the awareness is changing. And I think that means the funding to undertake projects is also changing. Yeah, definitely. Our, our lingo and awareness and uh, focus is, is changing rapidly in response to climate change impacts. Uh, so I think we're going to wrap up with a last question here. Um, uh, attendee is asking really cool stuff. Excuse my ignorance and lack of creativity. Wondering, aside from wake monitoring, what other uses do you think First Nations can have from this technology? Yeah, so First Nations are often faced with... Um, being a contributor to discussions on new projects in coastline, in coastal regions that affect their traditional waters and their um, their historical uh, uses of fishing or um, aquaculture, various other um, land and water uses. And um, so weather data can play a big role. Collecting long periods of weather data can help, for example, for aquaculture installations, it can help for the coastal engineering of certain regions. We know that um, there are a lot of changes happening inside harbors to support industrial projects. Um, some of those industrial projects um, may have very large impacts on traditional areas, even perhaps burial grounds, perhaps erosion, various things. And so this type of data can provide a reference and a guide to be able to provide baseline, but also um, in project measurement. And that helps uh, put data to something that's being discussed um, in addition to their observations and their traditional knowledge. So I know that's a lot of jargon and, uh, you know, kind of a long statement, but it's dependent on the region. Uh, but yeah, it can, it can involve coastal engineering, it can involve aquaculture, it can involve fishing grounds. Um, and it's largely about marine stewardship. Amazing. That's a um, fabulous, fabulous array of uses for this quite, quite small technology. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. Really appreciate your presentation. And we're going to take a very short break. Um, I apologize, I let this run a little long, but it was a fascinating conversation. And then we'll switch over to Brayden's presentation. So thanks so much, Scott. And uh, let's take two minutes, and we'll come back at 1118 to hear from Brayden, our last presenter of the day. All right, welcome back after a very short break. Um, uh, Brayden is going to present today uh, without his camera on as he's having a little bit of connectivity issue, but uh, we'll hopefully still be able to get the whole of his presentation. So to introduce you to Brayden, Brayden Gibson Ray is the Director of Technical Sales and Training at Seymour Marine Limited, and he's created a niche in the maritime sector through his advocacy for the use of remotely operated vehicles to bolster safety and operational efficiency in maritime shipping. At Seymour Marine, Brayden provides innovative and customized solutions for underwater robotics and marine technology. His passion is to empower customers and partners with the best marine technology and education. And I will hand over to Brayden to... Uh, share all about these ROVs. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today um, speaking with all of you. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking about ROVs and how we can uh, help make the shipping lane safer and shipping in general safer with these products. Um, so a little bit about Seymour Marine. Uh, we were founded in 2006 in Nanaimo, BC. Um, we are the oldest ROV manufacturer in Canada um, with a history of supporting the maritime sector, specifically on the island and in the channel. I want to talk a little bit about our, our ROV design before I get into the applications and the toolings that, that our ROVs are being used on. Um, when we design our ROVs, we were designing them to be modular and equip a number of sensors, cameras, sonars, um, to be able to make missions as effective as possible. Um, looking at our um, some of the equipment on here, we have auxiliary cameras, altimeters, uh, a tunnel profiling sonar, 
um, a mechanical scanning, scanning sonar as well. So we can really equip whatever the mission needs for, for in terms of sensors and sonars. Um, here's a look at one of our customers with both arrays. He's got an imaging sonar as well as a mechanical scanning sonar um, to be able to get the best data possible out of the ROV. We're also currently equipping stereo cameras to be able to create 3D models and scans of underwater assets such as shipwrecks, um, infrastructure, tunnels, et cetera. Um, we're also equipping ultrasonic thickness gauges to be able to understand the thickness of metal in the subsea environment to avoid corrosion um, and making sure that things are not being environmentally impacted. We can also equip cathodic detection probes um, to understand the states of uh, steels and hard metals. So here I wanted to break it down to two kinds of inspections, both vessel and then subsea inspections. Um, as you can see here, we're currently involved in hull inspections, propeller and rudder checks, security assessments, uh, ballast tank inspections. And on the subsea inspection survey side, we're doing pipeline and cable routes, environmental monitoring, wreckage and debris analysis, and ghost recovery, ghost gear recovery. Clean hulls reduce drag, leading to lower fuel consumption and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Early detections of biofouling with an ROV can help prevent, also prevent the spread of invasive species. Identifying leaks and breaks early helps prevent environmental disasters like oil spills or chemical discharges, uh, which can have devastating effects on our, on our environments. Removing hazardous materials and pollutants from sucking vessels uh, protects our ecosystems from the potential toxic, toxic releases. ROVs conduct underwater security inspections, search for unauthorized devices or contrabands attached to hulls. Uh, this prevents illicit activities that can lead to environmental hazards, such as release of toxic substances or the transport of invasive species. Ensuring vessel security also mitigates the risk for maritime accidents that can result in oil spills or other harmful discharges. Ensuring that uh, your propeller and routers are clear of debris uh, is super important and our ROVs allow you to get a, a bird's eye view of what the condition of these, uh, of these props are and making sure that they're seaworthy. So ballast tanks inspections, making sure, you know, we designed this small ROV to be able to get into confined spaces and be portable. Um, and being able to get in a ballast tank is just that you need a small unit with a uh, condensed package. So we're able to supply our, our partners with um, a small modular ROV. Um, ghost gear recovery is super important. Um, Retreating ghost gear can reduce the mortality rates of marine uh, mammals and fish uh, due to entanglement and ingestion. Uh, the removal of ghost gear also allows us to be able to uh, clean a habitat and revitalize it. Um, and that was, that was it for me. Here's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions here in the chat. Thanks so much, Brayden. Um, yeah, a lot of potential applications and it was great to see some of the examples you shared. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the ghost gear recovery. Do you use the ROV to find the ghost gear or can it actually also bring it back or do you need to have a uh, another vessel there? And I guess how how far away can you deploy it? Is it attached to... Um, a support vessel, any other any other details you can share? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we can both identify and work on the recovery. Um, depending on the weights of the of the gear, our ROV can retrieve them or also be used as a as a guide 
to um, discover or grab and return the device to the top side. Um, we can we have access to up to three kilometers of tether, um, so we can work off the coast or off a support vessel. Um, really, all we need is is power, and we're we're able to deploy anywhere. I guess you have a you have a person operating. How many how many people does it take to deploy and and do one of these uh, ret retrieval efforts? Yeah, generally generally we say it's a two person operation. We need we need an operator as well as a um, generally a tether manager working with the tether to make sure that it's it's not getting um, snagged or entangled on any of the support vessel um, props. Um, so it's generally a two man operation, but we we're definitely one man deployable when when needed. And uh, we've got a couple of questions coming up in the chat. Uh, Jack Gallagher is wondering, do you have the capacity, the capability to work in moderate to high current environments? So I guess what are your restrictions for deploying? Yeah, gen generally speaking, um, we can deploy in up to about two knots of current. Um, generally, it takes some planning. Um, making sure that you have a have a great uh, have a great plan going into action and knowing what the current is um, in your area is super important. Um, but about two knots of current currently. Any other conditions that would affect uh, your ability to to operate or restrict prevent you from going out? Yeah, obviously, obviously, current's the biggest one. Um, but just understanding your your environment, having a pre dive plan is always super important. Um, being able to um, know know what entanglements are available or expected um, layouts of the seafloor, those sort of things. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Cody Warner. How does Seymour compare to other Canadian ROV companies such as Deep Trekker? Sure. No, thanks for the question, Cody. Um, really, we're we're a smaller engineering firm focused on customized robotic solutions. Um, where a company such as Deep Trekker is very focused on um, submersible robotics, um, crawlers, um, smaller inspection class ROVs, um, where we focus more on on larger and and focus on payload capacity. A question from Robin Hulick, what are the maximum water depths the units can operate in? Is the larger unit hand deployable from a dock or vessel, or do you need a winch to uh, lower it down? Yeah, so we are uh, we are hand deployable. Um, we offer units in four different sizes. So the largest unit, currently we would need some sort of large system, um, but both the Chinook, Steelhead, and Coho, which are our smaller systems, um, are hand deployable. Um, and what was was there another part to that question, Megan? Sorry. A maximum water depth. How deep can you go down with your? You said you've got three kilometers of tether. Um, could you go straight down for three kilometers? So we're we're currently limited to about six hundred meters of of depth with the ROV. I wanted to go back to the um, the part you shared about being able to measure uh, metal thicknesses underwater. So there are a number of um, abandoned and wrecked vessels all around the Canadian coast, and there's also historical wrecks that are underwater that um, aren't visible but are still posing a potential threat to the environment from risk of uh, contaminant release as the metal rusts through. And some of these Vessels are getting to be quite old. There's, I mean, worldwide, there's many, many World War II shipwrecks that are getting concerningly aged. And have you been involved in assessing any of these wrecks, or do you see a potential for your technology to to help figure out which of these wrecks might uh, pose the greatest risk? Certainly, yeah. Lots of our clients are involved. On we're in all seven seas, looking at looking at different wrecks and and events. So. Um, right now, we're focused on making sure that we can get the best data out of those wrecks. So whether that's a imaging sonar or a 3D modeling sonar or a stereo camera, really understanding those conditions of those vessels is, is huge. And we're we're really looking for the best partners out there in terms of sensors and sonars to be able to do that. 
another question from Robin. From a technical point, what communication protocols are available to integrate additional sensors? And do the units have varying voltage outputs to power those sensors? Yeah, so we, we do offer, um, generally speaking, we're in an analog um, configuration, RS-45, um, which is actually an Ethernet protocol, but um, we have the ability to do both. We've, we've um, worked through some Ethernet-based systems as well as basic analog systems. Yeah, I had a, a question um, thinking about back to your use case of um, hull inspections to determine degree of biofouling. And I know that biofouling is something Transport Canada is working on guidelines to help uh, vessel operators know what, what and where, when they can clean. Uh, and also, I guess, if cleaning is needed is another aspect. And um, where and when can these hull inspections take place? As if you've got a vessel that's uh, covered in biofouling that could be a risk for invasive species, you probably want to address it before it gets into coastal waters. Is that is that a possibility or does it have to be near shore? Yeah, we, we can deploy the robot or the ROV off of uh, off the side of the vessel at sea. Obviously, speed's a big concern and making sure that the, the ROV can handle the, the speed and that the vessel's movement, but we can we can certainly observe biofouling remotely right off the deck of the ship um, from anywhere in the world. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share about any um, case examples that you might want to share? Uh, when I saw your your video for the first time, uh, it was looking at an underwater wreck, and I think you mentioned it was for a, a community wanting to understand the implications of that that vessel are there any recent use cases that you might want to share as how how this is being deployed to remove hazards or or better understand the the marine environment yeah our, our customers are, are deploying these uh, we have a customer out of halifax that uh, recently discovered a submerged tank on a on a second sunken vessel from world war ii um so there's you know there's Lots of discoveries being made daily um, with bio robots um, to understand those sort of um, the conditions of those wrecks, like I said. Um, so being able to pull the data from those is super important. And then in terms of that, that data, is it uh, available only to your customers? Is it available to others? Um, how is how is it being used and could it be used more broadly to help uh, improve marine situational awareness under the water? Yeah, I'll kind of take first his answer from this. The, the data belongs to our customers always. Um, we do get information shared with us on a, almost a daily basis. So if there's something that you're curious about or if there's a particular body of water you, you're looking for information on, um, we're happy to assist on a on a case by case basis if we if we're able to. That's great. Yeah, there's uh, certainly a lot of need for better data for decision making as uh, more and more uses in marine areas start to conflict. And I think this could be a really useful technology perhaps for even assessing how effective marine plant, uh, protected areas are are being. Um, are you are they seeing increases in biodiversity following the implementation of a marine protected area? And maybe that's something that can be measured with an ROV and cameras and other sensors. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think we'll we'll wrap up here for today. And thank you so much, Braden. Um, fantastic to see all of those different use cases and possibilities with underwater uh, vehicles. And um, really appreciate everyone's participation and all the questions today. And want to thank all of our speakers. And uh, oh, I guess just before we wrap up, there's one last question. Um, can you collect any live samples with the ROVs, water samples or algae samples, for example? Absolutely. We have uh, samplers available um, for both sediment and water. Um, so we're, we're able to collect on um, both of those. 
Fantastic. Okay, and I recall that I promised to put uh, the links to the other uh, sessions into the chat. So I have done that now. And if uh, anybody wants to go and see the previous sessions, we have a satellite technology, aerial technology, and shore-based technology prior to our today's focus on water-based technology. You can go and check out those recordings. And all of the slides are up on our, our website as well, clearseas.org. And you can always just search to, to find the appropriate session. Uh, so to finally wrap up here, thanks so much to everyone. The recording and slides will be posted on the webpage um, in a week or so, and I'll send out the links to everybody who registered for this session. And our next session is going to, our next end session is going to be on November 30th, starting at 10 a.m. again. And we're going to be featuring the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System, which is a data collection and sharing platform. So bring all of your questions about data and all of your thoughts about what kind of data, how and where you'd like to access it uh, so that you can help inform how this, this platform is being uh, developed and expanded. Uh, so if there's data you want to have, please come and, and tell us all about it on November 30th. Thanks all. Have a great day.